I hope you had a great lunch. Did you have a great lunch? Yeah. And we want to just say uh, congratulations to John and the entire team for putting on an amazing conference. So let's give them a round of applause. Okay, you guys are you guys are disappointing me a little bit. There is low energy in this room, so I need a lot of high energy because we're going to be talking about the revolution and evolution of not only the advertising and marketing and communications uh, world, but we're going to introduce you to some of the movers and shakers that are helping to push that revolution. And so I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, introducing them, but I do want to want you to know from our conversations already that. The new majority, as John and the team here defines it, represents spending power of over $4 trillion, as you already mentioned. And we're already seeing across the country that this country will be majority-minority in just a few years. And we're already seeing it with the places like California, Hawaii, New Mexico, Texas. And it won't be long before places like Florida, Arizona, Georgia, South Carolina, Illinois follow suit. So. I don't know why we're still having this conversation. That revolution have, should have taken a place years and years ago. But moving on, I want to introduce our great panel. Because what they're going to do first is they're going to tell you a little bit about themselves and what they're doing to promote this revolution. So you're going to have a very live wired group. So I'm going to have a hard time moderating this panel. Because once they get started, you won't want to hear from me again. But to my immediate left is Shei Fu. Now, Shei Fu comes from China. She immigrated here when she was a young, young child. She immediately adopted the American dream and rose up through the ranks to end up at a place like McCann, where McCann basically said, hey, uh, we want you to fix our organization and bring together the talent all around the world and put them in one place. And so she ultimately <clears throat> became one of the key leaders as a at a company called Kraft where you pull together all the craft leaders of one organization and get them to sing and hum. And so she's our very first panelist to my very left, and that's Shea Fu. Welcome, Shea Fu, please. Energy here. I'm going to try not to butcher this man's name because it doesn't seem very intuitive to me, but this man has been around for 30 plus years, moving and shaking the advertising world and the marketing world for over 30 years working for different agencies like the Mingo Group uh, when they had an African-American focused interest when companies were actually realizing that there are black people in this country. And then he moved on to advise a lot of different companies, including Diageo, and rose up the ranks there to help this beverage company understand the importance of the multicultural markets here in the United States, and then went on to a company called Publicis, which is one of the big holding companies. And he's one of the leaders at Publicis, Publicis sapient, where he advises not only the internal team but external teams about how to reach this growing, diverse, new majority markets here in the U.S. And that is Mark Straw Sean. I have called this man more names than I would like, so I'm glad that I got his name correct. And two, his immediate left is Lily Kiel. Vallenta. So if you don't know a little bit of Spanish, then you're probably going to need to move to another country because the Latino community has grown <laughs> quite prominent, not only in this country, but around the world. And it is a population in the new majority that we cannot ignore. And Lily, she's got multiple hats. And so all their bios are in your, your packet. But I wanted to just mention that Lily is the co-founder and CEO of Cien Plus in Culture Intel. She's also the creator of Dreamer Ventures. And in her spare time, she uh, does some commentaries on very small networks like Fox and MSNBC, um, talking about culture and the intersection of cultures, not only in our lives, but it, with companies and organizations and how they influence popular culture. So that's Lily to the far to the left here. And then very last is Arun Kumar. He's the Chief Data and Marketing Technology Officer for IPG, which is Interpublic Group of Companies, Media Brands. He is the data analytics guy that helps keep Interpublic and the hundreds of agencies that are within their organization up to date on how to use data effectively and competitively to help support them in beating their competitors, allowing companies to understand that data and how to use it properly. And that's Arun. 
So this is our panel. So before we get started, I want to make sure that you start writing your questions down because we're going to spend a little bit of time toward the end of this and open it up to everyone. But I wanted to start off by allowing each of them to spend a couple of minutes telling their story and how they are contributing to the revolution and evolution of the advertising, marketing, and communications industry in this world with the new majority. So I'm going to start off with Shay Fu. Shay, the floor is yours. Hi, my name is Shay Fu. Uh, as as uh, Bill mentioned, um, I, I was born in China, made in China, but raised in New York. So, all right. so tell you a story. Um, I, I grew up in New York, so in the 80s, uh, what's every agent's uh, dream in New York? Uh, to be on Wall Street. That, that was the dream. So I landed uh, on the trading floor of uh, at the Wall Street firm uh, uh, junior year of high school. So got in, was on Wall Street. I was like, yeah, now I'm on the floor. Three months in. And mom and dad were really proud. Yeah, they didn't know what was going on because they didn't speak any English. Uh, <laughs> so went on. Got a job, they offered me a job, and as I went back to school and, and bald, I declined the job. I went back to my high school, my mentor, and I said, I, I hate it. I, I hate finance. I can't I can't see myself doing it. What am I gonna do with my life? And and I was planning all the finance colleges, NYU and everything. And they're like, go to go to you're so good at art and design. Go to art school. I'm like, Are you crazy? I'm an immigrant. We don't do art school. How am I gonna make money? You know, <laughs> and survive in this city. You're supposed to be good in math. Yeah, That's right. Wrong. What's wrong with you? So, so, so You're not I. Perpetuating stereotypes, which is. A yeah. Good well, thing. okay. I, I gave. I gave in. I got into school of visual arts. He didn't tell me it was a private school either. Uh, low income immigrant again. Um, so struggled to 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 get into uh, the 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 system and, and had financial aid and all that. So long story short, uh, that's how I got in and into the industry. And, uh, and McCann Wool Group recruited me about five years ago because they saw um, the industry changing in terms of culture. Right, the production side of Interpublic Group, uh, which is part IPG and McCann, and took our McCann resources around the world to centralize it and grew. And, and just it. so you know, just to interrupt, uh, McCann is one of the companies they talk about in Mad Men. <laughs> so, so if you think of Mad Men, well, that's the organization that you today. joined. Yes. So. And then we took we took the production units, tied it all together, the resources and workflow and technology, and helped our clients roll out campaigns globally, even in U.S. So I currently run I am MD of U.S. and uh, Canada right now. So what we do, especially for Microsoft, is our one of our biggest when we launch Surface and Windows 10. People did not realize when we launched Windows 10 around the world. Every single tile have these images. The apps on the Windows 10 in every single country is different. So when we launched in US, it was different from India, in China, in Taiwan. So our, we are the production arm to roll up and help our clients adapt culturally. <laughs> Even in US, like L'Oreal USA is one of them that recognizes the cultural differences in our country, right? The Spanish in New York City, Jenny from the Bronx, speaks differently from the Spanish in Miami, right? And the Spanish in uh, Texas. So when we do execute marketing, these big marketing campaigns are tied to the production arm, and we help them, we call it transcreate, because we have writers are in language. So if we need to target Flushing New York, the Chinese in Flushing New York, it's different from targeting Chinatown, Manhattan. And people do not realize that. There are so many differences and nuances. So you, you're, we're rewriting for these cultures. And clients are starting to, to see that and see the value of the cultural reverence, reverence uh, and, and uh, marketing. 
Well, great, thanks, Shay. And, and Mark, uh, we were talking earlier, so Mark and I were talking about taxis, and before that, Shay was saying, we're talking about unconscious bias. When are we gonna start talking about conscious bias uh, first? Because uh, we have conscious bias, but we don't really address that. And then uh, we were talking a little bit about taxi drivers, and I said, I have conscious bias against taxi drivers. I always think I'm gonna get ripped off, and Mark said, well, at least you can get a taxi. I can't. <laughs> so, um, so anyways, Mark, Thank you, Bill. No, it's true. Um, <clears throat> even with my zero Halliburton briefcase, I could stand in front of this building and I probably won't get a cab, but you might, and you might before me. I have to make my wife sometimes hail a cab for me. It's amazing. I've always born and raised here in Brooklyn. But anyway, we, we could spend a lot of time, and we don't have a lot of time on this topic, um, so no need to go into my background um, and waste time. Understand I'm here because of a lot of uh, time and water under the bridge. And I'd like to just start off by saying, as, as uh, folks sitting out in the audience, we want to make sure that you get your money's worth today so we might not be as politically correct as you might think we should. Uh, that said, uh, I started in my, <clears throat> I received a four raise fellowship a bunch of years ago, and I went to an agency called Compton, which is now Saatchi and Saatchi. And I found myself the only African American person, or what we might call a person of color, walking on the account management floor. Everybody else was in the mail room. And I remember there was a Hispanic sister who ran production. And as I'm walking around in my suit and tie, she says, excuse me, you, you, come, come, come here. I said, she says, what, what are you doing up here? I says, I says, well, I'm an intern here. I'm going, she says, oh my God, they let you in. She says, come, come, come with me. And she took me to her office and she says, you have to survive. She says, I'm gonna take you under my wing for these 10 weeks and help you navigate the landmines because she says, there's nobody else here like you. Now I was just an intern. That was my first case. The second case, I worked for a company called NW Air. It doesn't exist anymore. The oldest advertising agency in America. It used to be based in Philadelphia, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They created a bunch of lines, uh, reach out and touch someone. I can get what, go online. Um, but I remember someone saying, when I was on a team, the target audience for this particular brand are people who make $25,000 a year, combined household income, live in a multiple family dwelling, have gone to high school, da 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 And I was like, oh, well, oh, cool, I know a lot of those people, et cetera. We should be advertising this. Says, no, we're not talking about black people. I was like, oh, shit, I make $25,000 a year. I live in, I went to high school, et cetera. No, no, that's not, that's not, we'll, we'll save that for the black campaign. So the, we're dealing with issues that are deeply seated, and we're still talking about some of the same hurdles, someone said bullshit earlier, that we're, that, that we're, we're talking about. I can't find talent, bullshit. Uh, I don't know where, uh, I don't know how to reach the audience. Lily will tell you, bullshit. Uh, you know what, my money is green. So if I open my wallet right now, and pulled out, I don't have African-American money, okay? I got good old American greenbacks, and I spend my money accordingly. I drive a real nice car, I buy nice clothes, I send my kids to good schools, I eat in nice fucking restaurants. I would like the respect of marketers to respect me as a true consumer and value my dollar. So the $4 trillion that you talked about earlier is really where the game is played. And the fact of who controls those dollars and whether or not they really want those dollars is where the revolution of our discussion comes in. Because if we don't burn down the old myths, we're in the same place. CEOs and CMOs are what? Risk adverse. The average CMO's job is 18 months. Most CEOs today are two years, if they're lucky, because of what? Shareholder value. Nobody wants to take that mistake. Nobody wants to take the risk anymore. I, ch I actually thought Mr. Ryan's conversations earlier were outstanding. Um, so the baseline connectivity is really that money. But the evolution comes from building up, because if you look at the data, and everybody wants to understand where the opportunities are, right? Where is the growth? Where's your next 500,000 cases coming from? So when I ran the business at Diageo for not just a number of brands, but multicultural and specific, we were able to turn the tables on the discussion around performance, 
business delivery. I will drive cases of vodka and tequila through um, LGBT men, all right, and African Americans because the index pointed out that gay men, gay men drink three times more vodka than the straight men. And they drink two times much more, more tequila. Vodka was the driving force behind the business. Why the hell would I not double down on gay men? Why would I double down on them in the tequila? If, if, Hispa if Korean men were drinking six times more bottles of vodka a month and driving my Ciroc sales off the charts, why would I not double down over there? If, if the world of whiskey was being driven by Koreans, Chinese, and African Americans, and then in the world of, um, oh God, well, Buchanan's, Hispanics, why would I not double down over there? Well, because the principles of, the, of traditional whiskey drinkers is a man in his you know, robe sitting in front of a fireplace writing his memoirs. Is that shit gonna move another case of sales? <laughs> Or we're going to offend. Is that going to drive? We're going to offend our general market consumers. You know what I want? Offend him. I want the guy that's going to buy six bottles versus the guy's buying one bottle. So when we talk about the economics of what we do, the evolution and the the revolution of it, marketeers have to change. Understand, those of you who are leaders, and I'll pass it on. The game has changed. The fabric of economics of the world has changed. And your old hats and your old methods, you must throw them out of the fucking window. Okay? You are in the business of driving shareholder value, period. And to drive shareholder value means you must drive revenue, drive operating profit, etc. And that means fish where the fish are and don't be afraid. Thank you so. for that very polite conversation. <laughs> you told us not to be nice. Brother Mark. Well, you know, we had some really amazing panels, and I said, you know what, you guys tell the truth. Uh, because we hear a lot of things, you know, to, to reinforce things, but I want you to tell the truth because that's what you're here for. And so if we can't do that, then we're not giving you your money's worth. So adelante, Lily, and thanks, Mark, so much. The floor thank is yours. You. Thank you, thank you. I am so glad you're here, my friend. And everyone else, we had the, the, the great pleasure of working in the Diageo business together, so that was a lot of fun. So let me tell you a little bit about me and why I do what I do today, which hopefully you can borrow some stories from and adopt them as your own. Um, so I am originally from Colombia, and I came, woo, there's always one of us in the room, cierto? Hey, <laughs> Colombia. So I, I came to this country at the age of 17 by myself. My entire family is still in Colombia. I couldn't speak a word of English. I had a suitcase, a student visa, and I landed in Texas of all places. So talk about a cultural experience, right? Where everybody looked at me and said, oh, you speak Spanish, are you Mexican? And I'm like, I didn't know if that was like a real question or condescending or both. I just couldn't, I didn't understand it. And of course, when you say you're from Colombia, now I'm dating myself, you know where I'm coming from, my friend. They will be like, ooh, Pablo Escobar. <laughs> I'm like, why? There is coffee. You know, the kids now are so much, the kids are so much cooler now. They have Shakira, Sofia Vergara. I didn't have any of that, any of that. And here we have Netflix having to, you know, have me explain myself all over again with narcos, thank you. But it's a cultural gap that I discovered very early in my American experience. And I never thought that that, which really was like instilled in my brain, I was like, why are people so ignorant? I don't get it. Then I took it deep inside my heart as I started my corporate career. So I'm a traditional corporate professional and executive that I guess eventually dropped out of corporate life and now became a business owner. But I was in big companies uh, like Disney, I was at Johnson & Johnson for 10 years, and it was my career at J&J &J what inspired me to do what I do today. And I underscore that because I bet a lot of you here are corporate executives, right? And I'm not suggesting to drop out, don't leave, we need you in corporate America, but what I'm trying to say is my journey at J&J &J did not have a Hispanic, multicultural, nothing on my title. I was doing global marketing, but I felt responsible for carrying that cultural intelligence into the room whenever conversations were happening. So we can wait for everyone else to put it in the agenda, for the marketing team to do the marketing thing, for agencies to be hired to get it right, or you can start influencing where you sit today in whatever role you're playing today.
So what I did was create the Hispanic Employee Resource Group at J&J, &J, which to this day is 16 years old and thriving, um, and kind of made it my own job to present in front of the chairman, which was the last thing that I did, and the board of directors, how in the next five years, it was mathematically impossible for the company to achieve its goals without getting this right. And what is this? I'm talking about 2007. The fact that this eminent majority minority was coming and approaching really fast, and it's already here, and we're still having the conversation. So I guess that inspired me to create the company that I wish I could have found to hire at that time, doing global marketing, that can combine cultural intelligence, data-driven analytics, and the science in numbers of what it means to truly tap the full power of our <coughs> growth as a collective new marketplace, combined also with the agility and the creativity that the agency folks have. And that's what we do today. But I guess just to chime into the polite conversation of Mark. Um, I guess what I want to, because I know time is pressed, but I, I want you to stop putting this in somebody else's hands. I could have waited for my title to read multicultural something, which by the way, I have a love-hate relationship with multicultural right now. We can talk about that. I tell my clients today, don't say two words, the M word and the D word. Love them and hate them. <gasps> what are they? Multicultural and diversity. Because unfortunately, in this world of bias, which is here, and you can go and train yourself until you're blue in the face, and bias is, exists, is there. When you hear those two words, unfortunately, still in the business world, it translates into corporate social responsibility, small niche, the budget I cut if I don't have enough money, unimportant, underserved, corporate you know, community relations. Usually the first budget to go. Exactly. So we need to flip the language. So here's homework for you, if this is all I get to say today. Number one, you are the bearer of cultural intelligence everywhere you go. I don't care if you're in finance, if you're the intern, if you're in supply chain operations, whatever. Because you already have a cultural advantage and it's in your hands to activate that cultural intelligence power or not. Number two, you need to master the numbers. This is not about the right thing to do for the business, but the smart thing to do because it delivers shareholder value. So there's cultural equity and valuation into this story that transcends a good DNI, feel good campaign. Okay? And then the third thing is you have to, have to start integrating this advantage in your role today. There is some way, I wasn't asked to create the Hispanic Employee Resource Group at J&J, &J, saw the opportunity, it became the after seven o'clock job, but there was a need. There is power in that, and by the way, it's good for your career, Not, but don't just do it for that. Do it because you truly believe in the power of your cultural intelligence and your cultural advantage, but serve as that vessel um, with the knowledge, with the numbers, to change the conversation. It's no longer about doing multicultural marketing. It's marketing to a multicultural America, period. That's the way it is. That's the way New York looks like and all the major DMAs in this country. And today I'm just so excited to be able to do this with the power of big data, so we'll talk more. We're doing a lot of really cool stuff with machine learning, artificial intelligence, and really bringing a new language to the boardrooms of America so we graduate from talking multicultural to talk it about inclusive markets, <coughs> growth, opportunity, and shareholder value. So I am thrilled to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. I didn't drop an F-bomb or S-bomb. That's Mark's job. <laughs> I'm too used to being polite on TV, I guess. But um, no, please, please take it because you already have an advantage that most people outside or your colleagues don't have, but it's up to us to exercise it or not. Que tacones, I would say. Yeah. She's, got, she's got some strength there. So you can see this panel is very passionate about uh, this topic. So last but not least is Arun. We were having a little conversation about his issues at the airport through security. Oh and uh, I was trying to explain my issue. When I went to an agency, the president used to actually say to me, Bill, you're the expert on the Far East. Talk to the client. 
And so one day they brought the client to my desk and he said, Mr. Mata, what part of the Far East are you from? I said, Eastern Oregon. <laughs> so, um, so, so, but anyways, Arun, data, analytics, who are you? So I'm a brown guy who has data and technology in my title. If I wanted to, I couldn't stretch the stereotype anymore. Um, so, as you know, as part of my journey, I was born in India, and then I worked in China, Singapore, UK. My f my favorite uh, comments are there are at least twice when Singapore cab drivers have asked me this, and so I feel like I need to repeat that question and answer because it might help you. So the so I get into this cab, and the Singapore cab driver says, "So, pardon me for asking, but." are you the dark South Indian or are you the light North Indian who's fair? I'm like, moron, can't you see me and figure it out yourself? Like, I have to tell you that I'm actually dark. Um, and then, of course, my, uh, my favorite is always the airport where um, I think I'm most reminded of my identity in the airport because it, your title doesn't matter, what you do doesn't matter, the only thing that matters is the color of your skin. And it's so funny when you go as part of a delegation and there are four or five other people and they go into immigration and they just smoothly exit and you're the one <laughs> who they say, hang on, you need to wait over here because, hang on, I'm the same passport. I've got the same reasons to be here as those three. You cleared all of them and you want me to wait. And surprisingly, that's when the colleagues decide, well, we have nothing to do with this guy, we're off. <laughs> so you're stuck there explaining to this officer as to why you've, you've turned up. Um, and of course, my favorite is um, I love traveling through Germany. No, really, I do. Because every time I travel there uh, at customs, especially in Frankfurt Airport, even if I'm carrying just a small little bag, they have to stop me. What are you carrying? So once they had me open my suitcase, right there in front of where everyone is going through. They said, right, so, uh, sir, can you tell me how many clothes have you packed? The, uh, what's the question? Now, how many clothes, how many shirts, how many pieces of underclothes, how many trousers, how many kerchiefs? We're trying to guess whether you have packed the suitcase yourself or not. Well, I don't know, maybe I've packed six shirts, or who knows, maybe I sweat a lot, maybe I packed double of that. Why don't you take each and every one of my clothes and put them out and count it yourself? I spent another couple of hours in the dock because of that, because they were like, you can't be rude to a customs officer, but whatever. In Germany. You go to that back room. Yes, you go to the back room. I've been to the back room. Yeah, I it's. Colombian passport for a long time. Yeah, it's yeah, the moment they I've see that. I've been to the back room in another country. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really bad. So the one, the one thing which I would say is that as part of my current responsibility, where I am sitting um, enabling data sets to be used in advertising, here's what I see. Advertising historically has always claimed for years from the Mad Men era that advertising people are very good at reading what consumers want, who consumers are, and in reflecting that in the creative message and creating aspiration, blah, 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 et cetera. And the reality is that we've never had the mechanism to do so for years. So what did we do? We created this concept called a target audience. This one single mythical person who represents all those millions of consumers out there. And there would be detailed profiling. This person is Bob. He gets up at 6 in the morning. He switches on the radio. He decides he needs to have a bath. You sketch all of this out. There's a lovely piece of creative that is made and then you broadcast it out. Today, the reality is this. Bob's not the person buying the product and data tells you that. So back to the examples that Mark spoke about, the data shows you that. It shows you that there isn't one audience, that there are multiple audiences and the people who you thought are buying the product are not really the people who are buying the product. But here's what happens. Because we're so attached to this notion of commonality, we want to be inclusive. So I often go to these um, uh, meetings with clients and I say, well, the reality is your audience is fragmented. There are seven different types of consumers. They all need different messages. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, 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 the, brand, uh, the, the creative message is already ready. Well, I'm sorry, but you need to change your art of storytelling. Why can't a brand have different stories which actually make sense to the audience? No, it's got to be once, okay, it's done. Uh, 
show me who these audience segments are. You show them, and then the question that they say is, what's common amongst them? No, 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 let's celebrate their diversity. No, I want what is common amongst them. They all like to shop. <laughs> they all use mobile phones. Right, that's our strategy. We're going to create an M-commerce application that's going to allow you to buy products because they love shopping and they're all on their phones. So it's one common thing across those seven segments. And the reality is the data, the tech, the delivery mechanisms are all there to ensure that you can create 700 different stories for those seven segments. You can even upweight them because, as Mark said, you will find that your notions of who's buying the product is not actually true and that it actually makes more financial sense to upweight against segment six or segment five rather than the segments that you thought there were. And for a starter, I've, I've even noticed this, which I now start correcting with my own team, which is when they put these profiles of these audiences, invariably they're white faces. So I said, so hang on, data says 40% of this audience is African American, yet you've got three white folks. Like this slide is completely white. It has, it has no basis in you, and it, it even goes to the extent of, it's, it's not just color, it's even in terms of age. We've written down there that the person is 50 plus, and yet we're showing somebody who's clearly not more, not older than 30. Because that's the image that we want to create. We're so beholden to the images that we've created over the years. And it's so hard for us to go and confront and tell brands that the stories that you've been telling and the stories that you're continuing to tell, they're not true. Those stories don't resonate. And yet, why do they look for the commonality? Because then media becomes cheaper. You buy on that one demo, which is 18 to everybody. You don't have to differentiate. It becomes cheap to buy it. It's easier to justify. Because for the last 20 years, I've been doing the same thing. So I can go to the CEO and say, the, uh, my marketing cost is actually effectively going down because I'm now reaching even more people more effectively. Whereas the point is, it's not really resonating with people. And so that's, that's what I'm looking to change within the holding company, which is whether it comes to media or whether it comes to creative, think about these people differently. Don't think about them in terms of demos. Don't think about them as this one amorphous homogeneous group. Respect them and understand them. And it's OK to say that I was wrong in the last three years in terms of the targeting. And we have done it in some cases. But unless we start doing it, Materially, you're going to do the same thing. You're going to fish in the same pond. You're going to get the same results. You're going to blow more money trying to reach the same people, and you're going to completely allow the opportunity to go astray. Woo. This, is, this is good stuff. We could have a conversation just about that. So, uh, I think my mic's dying. But anyways, um, I want to get back to the questions, because it kind of feeds into what we were talking a little bit about earlier. Um, I know that Lily and Mark and Shay and Arun were all kind of unhappy with words like multicultural and diversity. So we're trying to eliminate that from the lexicon. Uh, but one of the things that I don't like is that companies always say, we're going to reflect the diversity of the consumers. Uh, if you were to give a letter grade to the advertising industry, uh, marketing industry, and to corporate marketers, what would that grade be and why? In terms of reflecting the diversity of their constituents. Can you go lower than F? <laughs> Is there anything lower than F on the scale of what we normally would grade something? It means closed. Because the reality of it is, is uh, I believe there might be one, and what we'll call a person of color or a woman that is a chairman or CEO of a major advertising agency. I'm just talking about the advertising side now. Um, most clients have to beg their agencies to have a diverse team to reflect the reality of what they're doing today. And if those clients don't drive it, agencies, by and large, not all, but by and large, don't bring it to the forefront. Um, and it's still, um, and, and, and I'm not saying this to be negative about anybody living in this area, but I'll use this as a, as a stopgap. It's still white, Darien, Greenwich, Connecticut, boys, and, boys Club, not even Boys and Girls Club, that tend to run the business. So when you move that down, um, you don't see a reflective reality of the diverse, if you want to say, cultures and thinking and thought and backgrounds, et cetera, that should be utilized and tapped into the drive business. 
Um, we're now in the fight to say because of political correctness and some things that happened, uh-oh, the shift has changed. It's now, it's the gender issue. I, I, got, I don't have enough women, uh-oh. I got sued, somebody called me out. We gotta have a gender issue now. But we've always had the gender issue, all right? So we keep moving the goalposts. First it was the 2000 census that said if you didn't have enough Hispanics, oh, okay, we're not talking to black people anymore, we're gonna talk to Hispanics. Now we're not talking Hispanics anymore, we're gonna talk to women. Oh wow, Indian people, Indian people have arrived. Oh, okay, we're going to talk to Indian people now. <laughs> and, and the reality of it is, is that, uh, folks, we're marketeers. We market brands, services, goods to people who have money, who want to either buy, enjoy, and exchange. Okay, I don't go to an African-American airport. Uh, I don't stay at an African-American hotel. It might be owned by one, but I, don't, I haven't stayed at one of those in a long time. All right, since the Chitlin Circuit. And the Chitlin Circuit is basically dead when I had to, okay? Think about it, folks. It, so I give it an F because it doesn't reflect reality. It's still the old boy network. And it's an industry that we all love and we've worked in and we've succeeded at, but it does not reflect the true reality. It has yet to grasp the true harness of the opportunity of that economic power and that diverse thinking in an audience. You cannot have real good solid thinking about, and I'll, and I'll use this as an example. If you wanna talk about a feminine hygiene product, and you don't have women at the table, you got a problem. It's easy to say, that's really, well, everything else kind of flows the same out of it. And you know what, when I travel first class, no, I, I never, I've never played on a basketball team. I had to throw that out. I can't tell you how many times, oh, what team do you play for? <laughs> we talk about our stories, oh, oh you know, what, what team are you on? And I said, no, nah, I, don't, I, don't, I don't play basketball. Are you sure? Wow, you look like that guy. And I know we all suffer this too, and I'll, I'll say the last thing, because I still get asked about this. Mark, tell me what all African Americans think. God damn, if I knew that, I'd be rich. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't speak for all people or that look like me or that came from what we might call African American backgrounds, all right? We all have different thoughts, ideas, focus, cultures, nuances, et cetera. And, and so we're still trying to put people in a box. We're still trying to, we don't want to deal with Arun's problem. We don't want to deal, Arun said it, we don't want to deal with the fragmentation of it. That's hard. It could be expensive. It could be time consuming. Ooh, Lily looks like she wants to jump right in. Lily, I can, or do you agree? Would you, you give I, I do, I do. But, but I'm hopeful. Here's the, the glass half full so version of F the same answer. F plus or what? No, 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 same thing, below the F. But I'm going to tie like what, uh, what Arun said and Mark. Um, it's a matter of time. Like big companies move slow. And the industry as a whole moves slow. So yes, maybe we are a product of what media companies have done to ourselves, forcing us to tell them what segment you're buying against. But technology is moving faster than that. And that is why you have companies that all of a sudden are dwarfing the big guys and then the big guys are like whoa what just happened because of the agility of digital because the agility of artificial intelligence and machine learning and those are fancy terms that are real they're here what does that mean it means that each and every one of us in this room right now if we each open our facebook today the way your feed is structured sounds like the people that shows up the words that are dialed up are specifically engineered for you. And that's scary because it kind of puts you in a bubble of you only see the stuff that is supposed to be relevant to you, but that's the way technology works. So the 700 messages, as daunting as that seems, it's available and readily doable today, today. But we get lazy. And this notion of total market, which is another word that I hate, it's just code for being lazy. Or the fact that I can't find, I love what uh, uh, Tim said of like busting the pipeline myth. Oh, I can't find the talent. Yes, you can. But here's the thing, and this is very important for those of you here in corporate America, because we do, again, don't leave. We need you there. We need you there influencing. But here's the thing. People need to realize 
that representation or counting black and brown and women faces in the room is not what delivers the ROI or the innovation, but is a culture and a mindset of inclusion, not a representation. So I cringe also when I just hear companies getting stuck in the number, percentage of women on boards. Okay, that's great. But if you see the percentage of new hires that are women or minorities and only 2% stay because the culture is impossible, then you're not doing a good job. You're just checking the box. And true innovation thrives when you create an environment that allows for this exchange to flow without judgment. And always tying it back to the fact that there is one consumer that delivers value, that ties into my sales numbers, and ties into your bonus at the end of the year, and the shareholder report, that is gonna make it all worth it. But we're not there yet. I think we're still in a very basic dialogue of representation, of percentage off count, diverse late count, that is not translating it all the way through to valuation, or what I like to call cultural equity, that delivers this, like, you know, not multicultural, <laughs> but, but, but really diverse looking group. So, so I hear what you're saying, but uh, in a lot of the companies, so Mr. Ryan from PricewaterhouseCoopers said that we, he agrees, it's BS, that there's plenty of talent out there if you really look. Uh, but a lot of the agencies and a lot of the corporations uh, attract Latinos, African Americans, Asian Americans, and they talk about their numbers. 40% of our new hires are Asian, Latino, African American, LGBT, vets. Uh, but then what they don't talk about is the people walking out the back door. Mm -hmm. So what is the solution, do you believe, um, to get people? You talked a little bit about it, engaging them, uh, not judging them. Uh, somebody said earlier from the other panel that you need empathy. But what are we going to do? What do the agencies need to do and corporations need to do to keep those people? Mm -hmm. It's not a problem finding them. 40 50 percent come through the door. But then if you ask them what the retention numbers are, well, <clears throat> 30, 40, 50, 60 percent of them are gone. Yep. So what do we need to do to keep them? I can answer that. Go for it. Yeah. So one of the things, I mean, today, I mean, we've been hearing about uh, visible inclusion, right? So you have these people come in, and we need the numbers and everything, especially on the marketing side. I mean, kids are dying to get into marketing and the creative field, but keeping them in there when you get, when, once they get in there and they come up with these awesome ideas that it reflects their culture and their background and they present it to clients or internal leadership teams, those clients or internal leadership can't relate, especially internal leadership, can relate and, and says, and kills it before it even goes to clients. Or when it does go to clients, and those clients are the ones that are mandating or have you know goals for our agencies to hire a diverse team, it doesn't do us any good when we have visibility. Okay, Sharon, I'm going to challenge you a little bit. You mentioned that the clients are pushing the agencies and pushing uh, the companies uh, that are doing the marketing to really reflect and have a diverse talent pool. But are those clients putting some teeth behind what they're saying? So I, I know a couple of companies have put the teeth, said, hey, uh, we want your team, your agency, to reflect truly the diversity that exists in our country. But what is the ramifications if you don't? And are they checking? Because I remember uh, at our agency, one of the big auto companies came by because we were mandated, the entire uh, company was mandated, all the different agencies were mandated to make sure there were more women and people of color. So in walks the auto company, and I get promoted from a cubicle to an office. And I'm waving at the ex uh, executives walking by, and they go, Bill Amara, he is our expert on Asia. And then Juan from the mailroom gets elevated <laughs> to a, t and, and he doesn't know anything, so he doesn't, because he works in the mailroom, he knows everybody in the room, but he's waving. And then as soon as the clients are gone, you can go back to your cubicle. So is there any teeth behind uh, the companies saying you got to be diverse. You've got to have a, a diverse workforce. Are you seeing that? I'm seeing it, but I'm, I'm seeing it with clients that are really serious that have identified, first of all, the CMO, the CEO is not afraid. Yeah. They're not afraid to hold agents. They, first of all, they hold themselves and their companies feet to the fire, and they will hold their vendors to do the same. 
um, and they will then challenge those vendors accordingly, and they will hit them where it hurts, which is in the pocketbook. So I will either cut your fee or hold back your fees, or you won't get your bonuses, what have you. And agencies run on fees, and, and that's really what it comes down to. They don't make anything else. It's all intellectual property. They don't make widgets. They don't make water. They don't make lug nuts, shoes, what have you. They got no retail store. If they can't build fees, they don't drive revenue. All right, so therein, therein lies at the end of the day where the hustle. So that's why I say clients, always, clients have the ability to drive the story and drive the focus. Some of them do, some of them don't. Um, but, but the challenge there still, still exists because clients will say, but I don't run your business, so I can't tell you. But some, you know what, you can dictate. So I was able to dictate as a client. I was able to dictate how my agencies worked, how they worked on our business, what we wanted out of them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And nobody told me I couldn't do it, right? And the end result is as long as they perform. And so performance at the end of the day is, is what we're going into. And, and our challenge here is growth, and our challenge here is driving revenue um, and operating profit, et cetera. And if you, if, again, if you follow the dots, Aaron said it, if you follow the, the reality of culture, Lily has said it, um, you'll follow where the money is going. And at the end of the day, you've got to deliver performance. If I've, if I've got to grow at 3% and the industry's growing at 4 Wall Street is holding me back. The FTSE is going to hold me back. I'm going to get dinged. i got to outperform the industry. So at 3%, I don't care how, I mean, I've got to drive sales. Yeah. And I've got to be able to connect with people who want to buy. Consumers have more, dis more not only discernible income, but more ability to say, no, I don't want Captain Morgan, I want Sailor Jerry. Or I don't want Johnny Walker, I want Chivas Regal. All right? And how am I gonna get them to connect with that brand versus that brand? How am I gonna get you to buy the Cadillac versus the BMW? How am I gonna get you to buy the Rolex versus the Patek Philippe or the, or the Swatch? And really that what it comes down to is that we are marketeers and we continue to put people, we get away with, we get away from what you just, what you mentioned earlier is the data, the technology, the understanding, the cultural dynamic and all that other stuff that's so important. And then we bubble it by saying, but I only want these people. So do you not want the rest of this money? Do you not want these four or 500,000 cases? I had salesmen, ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna end on this because I could get really crazy about it. but. Again, I'm driving the largest vodka business in the world. In the world. I went from 65,000 cases. Where's Danielle Robinson? One of my colleagues over there. Ciroc went from 65,000 cases being a brand targeted to a white man sitting in front of his uh, fireplace in his velvet slippers writing his memoirs. 65,000 cases for the entire year, for the entire country. We changed the entire strategy, we changed the entire position, we went to sophisticated celebration, we hired Sean Combs, and next thing you know, I'm selling two million fucking cases. You know what my boss said? Give me 10 more of those. Give me 10 more of those. Because at the end of the day, the dollars, we were Pablo Escobar, we couldn't make money fast, we couldn't hide the money fast enough. <laughs> um, but the, the reality of it is, is that people will value share. Yeah. People will value revenue. But I did have some people to say, even with that, that's not our consumer. So Arun and, and Shay, I cut you off, Shay, so I want to make sure you get a chance to answer the question. No, I totally agree. You know, um, what Mark just said. It's, it's, you have to look at the data, and you have to go after the customers that are interested in your product and not image, right? or what you think your brand image should be. Oh, but, but okay, the last thing. I had salespeople that would, again, LGBT, gay men, driving the number one growth driver of the industry, and I couldn't get my salesmen to go into LGBT clubs and LGBT liquor stores to drive the product. Hmm. Talk about bias. Why are you afraid of that money? Why are you afraid of that case sales versus that case sales? Mm -hmm. When that guy's driving 10 cases and that guy's driving one case. That, that's when I say that when you have the numbers, the business case, and all the dollars right in front of your nose, and you don't do that, 
It's personal bias getting in the way of good decision making. Personal bias getting in the way of good decision making. Yeah, I think so. To the question of whether clients actually care, call me cynical, but I come from this happens in most media pitches where um, there's a lot of inis initial chemistry meetings that take place. And in those chemistry meetings, the conversation is around what's the kind of team that's going to work on your business? Um, are you going to reflect? The consumer, uh, so we even had a case where someone challenged us and said, we would like you to have the team that reflected the makeup of the US in another 10 years time. Okay, great. Um, and it's going to be X, Y, and Z. So we go through the entire process. Then procurement enters the room and says, right, let's now start negotiating. So all that stuff about the right kind of people, et cetera, goes out the door. And another agency turns up and says, I can do this for 100 bucks less. Do you know what? That 100 bucks is what they want. So, and the reason why I'm cynical is because you just had three months of conversations with me, and the one thing that you stressed to me is that who works on your business is critical. You, you're, you wanted to make sure that, uh, and in many cases this happens from clients, that they want uh, a good representation of women. Um, in, because now, like Mark said, not having gender parity is the big thing. Uh, how many women have you got in your team? Oh, we've stopped this. Okay, who's going to actually run the account? So we put a lot of effort in making sure that you get the team that you want, the product that you want. And then in the end, it comes down to, I can write a check for 100 bucks more. And all those values that you just said just went out the door, even though we could prove that our audience segmentation, our diversity in the way we are going about it is all going to drive higher value. But that 100 bucks, which someone was writing as a check here and now, the cost cut makes more sense. And that's why I'm a little bit cynical in the sense I don't see that behavior at the final hurdle change. Whereas those same organizations will sit on panels and point a finger at the advertising industry and say, you're not representative. And you haven't spoken to your own procurement business. Let me tell you, you, you ask your procurement people, there is only one color they understand. How many bucks are you going to save for me? Mm -hmm. well, I think the ad industry actually sets the pace for uh, inclusion in many respects, even though they make some mistakes here and there. But I want to open it up. Uh, I didn't get to ask, ask all my questions because you could see this is a live wire panel. Yeah. But let's open it up. Bill, can I just one sure. final Lily. thought? Absolutely. Because I want to make sure we, we take away the right spirit here. Years, there is a lot of work to do, but that is an opportunity for everyone in this room. We are already unique, blessed, and have a higher value valuation as a professional and as an individual just by being here. And I'm not talking about those of us that are black and brown, Asian, but <coughs> white and everything, because that means that you in this room already have a higher sense of cultural intelligence, as I keep calling it, and now you have to do something with that. Now the other thing is that we need to graduate from a language of representation to one of valuation and equity. So equity not in terms of equality and counting heads and brown heads and women heads, but what is the result that this collective group versus this one is able to deliver at the end of the year in terms of ROI and value. That is the only way this really becomes a serious conversation that transcends the feel good HR representation stuff. So I hope that we can feel accountable and responsible to this because it's not about entitlement or I deserve that because I am the woman-owned, minority-owned business and you gotta hire me through supplier diversity, but because we're damn good and we're gonna triple, double, whatever yourselves, and that's why you want us in the room, not because I am there to check off your women and Latina card. So we each need to be accountable to that, otherwise we do a <coughs> disservice to ourselves and to our entire community and in this entire dialogue. Well so said. Questions? Can you uh, stand up and tell us who you are and what your question is? Yes, uh, Dane. Oh. Baviksha. <laughs> um, hello, I'm Baviksha Rancha from IPG. Um, the question I had is we're seeing. Um, looking at the top, looking at executives, whether it's in politics, whether it's in 
um, whatever industry we're working in, we don't see people, minorities. We see people who are actually making the de de decisions, people who are, who are um, making change. We don't see people of color in those positions. Why, why is that? So why are we not seeing people of color at the senior most ranks of agencies and corporations? Everybody's talking about it, but why aren't we seeing it? So I represent Ad Color, um, 12 years old, probably the most focused organization for diverse people in the media, marketing, and advertising industry um, in general. And it has nothing to do with just being people of color. But what it is is that somebody said it earlier, uh, and it has to do with recruitment. I can recruit anybody, ladies and gentlemen. I can I could recruit anybody, any day, anywhere. But can I retain them? And that's what it comes down to. Um, can I? Between the recruitment and the retention, there's a boatload of work that has to happen. And it's, it's nurturing, it's development, it's coaching, it's, it's allowing people not to make the same mistakes that others has, helping them avoid the pitfalls, supporting them when risk is involved, right? Just like other people make mistakes. We learn from our mistakes, not penalizing people, and then promoting them accordingly when they do good jobs with titles and money and all the other trappings that everybody wants and leveling the playing field because that's why people stay. If you have got me over here and you are, you've just, you have just using me like a dish rag and not respecting me, I'm not getting paid, et cetera, then it becomes a transactional game. So at $14,000 here, well I should say, that's, that's kind of where I started out years ago, uh, Let's say somebody comes in and, and they're making $250,000, but somebody in tech calls them and pays them six hundred. dollars see ya. That's right. See ya. Why should I stay here? Because you've made it a transactional game. There's no growth here for me. There's no opportunity. Are you ever going to allow me to get into that corner office? Am I ever going to be the chairman and run this company, et cetera? Probably not. Why? Because of biases or what have you? Probably not capabilities. So that's why you're not seeing them at the top because they're not matriculating to the top. They're leaving and they're going other places or they're giving up or they're hitting ceilings, all right? And so as a result, that's what you're dealing with. And that's why the word multicultural is a problem, the, the, the dynamics, because the people at the top, they hear multicultural and they go, oh, oh, that's to keep the right reverend off my lawn. Yeah, yeah, that's the, that's the check I gotta write for the dinner dance that, you know, makes somebody over there go away. It's corporate responsibility. It's not about driving shareholder value and moving cases. And so the language, the, all that stuff has to change. But that, that's big, a huge part of the reason. They just don't stay. Shay wants yeah. to answer as well. Well, I think, I think from a Chinese, Chinese woman perspective, I mean, it's, uh, someone said it, our culture, right? We, we, we respect the elders. There's certain culture that we have. And it's not very natural. It doesn't come naturally for me. To, to be an MD of North America, it doesn't. Because when you're getting to a certain level and, and, and you have to have those important mentors and sponsors within your company to push you. I had fantastic sp sponsors. I had sponsors I didn't know about. I had sponsors that told them that told, told me that they were my sponsor. I'm like, I don't want the job, <laughs> you know, because I don't really, you know, they, because you have when you get to a certain level, you have to battle. When you're at that table, you're battling. So I'm battling in the boardroom of men, okay, white men most of the time. And I'm the Chinese girl from Brooklyn, you know? So, so it really takes a certain character. And, and you, and I think this team here, look for yourselves. Like, look at your rising stars within the company and, and make them more confident. I, I am confident in the boardroom only because I, ha I know the people in that boardroom is going to stick up for me and got my back. I know who's going to say no and who's going to say yes before it votes, right? So if I'm getting something approved, I know right off who I have to charm and who I have to get. So it's very important. <coughs> Take a look at your rising stars. And, you know, uh, I think one of the questions you had was, you know, are you sponsoring someone? And then I have a rock star in, in, in the audience, Lena Ng, and she runs Craft New York in Craft New Jersey. I sponsor her. I push her. You know, she's, you know, I push her, I send her into that boardroom, and it's like the lion's den. And I'm like, go get him, 
<laughs> you know, so that's, you know, I think that's what you need to do, especially in, in the Asian community, because we're all, you know, we're very, a little timid and we're polite, right? So not when you get into that boardroom and not when, you know, and, 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 and uh, I, my team knows I have two styles and sometimes it becomes three. So you're either going to see the tiger mom or you're going to see the free range mom. So, <laughs> so I have, my staff I have knows. not seen the free range mom yet. <laughs> the free range, no. you can do whatever you want as long as you stay within my compounds. <laughs> and then the tiger mom, I'm going to be up your ass and micromanage you. If I'm, I'm micromanaging you, that means you need to do better, you know. So, so and and tell them and and push push your teams. And I think that's that's you know that that really helps. I like that about you, Shay. <laughs> uh, and uh, unfortunately, uh, we're yeah. being on, getting on the that, gaps. So um, go for it. Sorry, I keep feeling like I'm, I'm leaving you all with homework and accountability, but that's how it starts. We can wait for somebody else to fix it. It's gonna take time. And yes, there's a problem in the middle, kind of like Mark was describing. But if you today are not today pushing and pulling others around you, myself included, that means you and I are part of the problem. So pushing and pulling starts today, right now. With the colleagues you have around, with the rock stars you have that you're pushing, and if you're not being pulled, ask to be pulled. That's a cultural thing with Latinos too. We don't ask. It's weird. It's like, you just keep your head down, do a good job, they will notice. No, they won't. So um, I think that's it. But I, think we, but I think we need to he help each other. One thing that I love about John and this organization is he's brought us all together, but I, I don't think that we do enough, Asian Americans in particular, do enough to help Latinos and African Americans. And, and whenever I go to board meetings, I always see African Americans on my boards, you know, Asian boards. But do you see any Asian Americans on African American boards or on Latino boards? No, so I do think that we have an obligation to each other yes. as well to pull and support and push each other. And unfortunately, we have to wrap up. I know you had a question. Can we have one more question, John? Because this, but this brother over here has a question. So, I, I have to ask this. Uh, Damon Williams with the Executive Leadership Council. I have noticed for the last year, every commercial that I have seen has been a black woman, white man concept. At first, I was fine with it. I saw it. Okay, we getting we getting interracial. This is a beautiful thing. But then I'm seeing it on every commercial. Black woman, white man. British black woman for uh, Alexa, white man. Fat black woman, white man. It's all, we it see it too. Like, yeah, it almost <laughs> feels like a fetishist type of behavior. And so Aaron, I, first I'll ask you, and then Mark, I know you're gonna help me with this. Is there any number? You don't have to worry about Mark. Yeah, no, Mark's good. Aaron, is there any numbers that we are seeing where this, why this is happening, why this trend is Arun, going this way? Arun, this is a question Arun. right for so, you. Is so all of you, the, the data, the data usually has nothing to do with what the creative actually turns out to be. So I'll tell you how this probably came out. It's so true. The way this would have been is someone like me would have sat in the room and said, okay, show me what your script is. And they would have said, well, here's the script, et cetera, et cetera. And then someone else in the room would have been, the data guys just presented that the population has just become diverse and they've created these funky audience segments. And someone said that 30% of the uh, audience is uh, African American. Ooh, hang on, this is really great. 30% is African American. We need to show that we're really progressive. How do we show we're really progressive? Not only are we going to show African-American, we're going to show African-American women. Because it, it goes back to, I mean, it goes back to the tick box exercise, right? So when you're sitting, because all these ad guys are also managers, they're also being told in diversity, you're falling short on African-Americans and on women. So you need to find African-American data analysts. So it's the same thing which they translate. Oh, it'll be a really good idea. It's such a cool thing for a brand to go and, and you know what, the creative community, the media community, we're all, it's a pretty small world, right? And they all cross-pollinate and they all go from one agency to the other, et cetera, et cetera. So that's how invariably a creative gets produced. 
Now, if, if a creative director is really out there, he'll say, wait a second, I'm going to change the stereotype. I am not going to show a slim African-American woman. She is going to be fat, and the guy is going to be thin because I want to show that my consumers are accepting of anything. I'm not kidding you. That's the kind of thinking that permeates in some cases, and it's yeah. because they, it's not that anyone is thinking there and saying, I'm going to insult African-American people. It's just that they are so used to thinking in a certain way, and they're trying to be either politically correct, or they're trying to be cool, or they're trying to own a certain space without really knowing who their true consumer is. One of the problems with data is when you start seeing just numbers, that's not human. When I tell you 30% African American, do you actually know their lives? Do you? So one of the things that you know, some of the companies make you do, which I think many, many of us should do, when I was working in the P&G business in China, they made us go on road trips. We used to spend days with consumers. <coughs> Why aren't you using a diaper? And some of the reasons that they would give you, we wouldn't have an answer. Our advertising wouldn't have an answer. We couldn't give an answer, and we would struggle. But, but most of the people who design these creative, they actually don't spend that time. They just they either don't have the time. They don't know. They don't know your life. They they don't know your life. They're making an approximation based on some signals, and they're choosing to read certain signals and not read the other signals, based on their biases. Okay, I'm going to have to end. We're going to have to end here. I want to say thank you to the panel. But by the way, you and the audience have the power to say something about these commercials, and if you don't, they're going to keep doing it. So. So you got it, you, oh yeah, like H&M example. So anyways, you have the power to do that. I want to say thank, thank you to this you. panel. Thank you. Thank you. I could talk to these guys all day long, seriously. So thanks so much. <laughs>